Ready to roll. Angus is um, the Sea Search Data Officer, and he's got the unenvious, unenviable role of making sure that our Sea Search data are really accurate. For example, no more dives located in the dry bit in the tea rooms, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and Angus has been using some sea search data to try and model recent range change um, in crawfish. Right, over to you, Angus. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks very much for the invite uh, to come and speak to you guys this evening. Um, I think I'll do the same. I'll, I'll chop off my video and uh, um, get the uh, screen up and going. Um, Lynn, can you just let me know that it's visible when it uh, when it's when it's going, please? No. Yeah, one second. No. One sec. One sec. All right. Hopefully that should be coming your way now. Yep, that looks good. Okay. All righty. Um, yes. So as uh, as Lynn just mentioned, um, I've been using some of the uh, sea search data to um, try and establish whether it can be applied to kind of modern statistical methods for establishing whether there are useful patterns and in, in changes in populations that we can we can detect. So hopefully everybody that's listening kind of knows what sea search is. Um, if you don't, maybe we can uh, um, have some questions afterwards. But I've, I've assumed that everybody knows what sea search is, so I haven't got any kind of explanation about that. So we we've been seeing really clearly in the last couple of talks that the the marine world is very spatially variable and also varies varies through time as well, um, and it's subject to a whole load of different uh, threats and pressures uh, and as a consequence of those various threats uh, there have been designations of uh, well, I think we've got over 370 uh, marine protected areas now um, that are established to try and provide some minimization of the uh, the effect of those those threats And if there are threats and things are changing the environment, if we want to understand how uh, there may be trends in populations, or if we're wanting to look at um, and assess, quantify changes in response to the changing climate, or if we want to try and pull apart the effect of anthropogenic or human driven signals from natural variability, we need uh, observations and data that are collected um, at multiple trophic levels, so not just plants, not just big fish and not just snails, we need all sorts and we need them spread over uh, broad scales uh, and the really important thing is that it's sustained, it's not just a few windows of data from, from here and there. And uh, sea search I think we can now really truly say it's large scale and uh, a sustained long-term time series. Um, we're pushing up towards uh, 800,000 species records now. Um, we've got 32 odd years of data um, covering pretty much every bit of coastline around um, Ireland and the, uh, the British Isles. Um, so it's a fantastic resource to have. And the, the post that I'm in was created specifically to try and make more use of, of this fantastic, uh, fantastic resource. Um, so, the focus uh, for most of this talk is going to be the, the spiny lobster or crawfish. Um, and uh, oh, I, I may be teaching granny to suck eggs here, but uh, um, I'll, I'll in for a penny anyway. Um, it uh, used to have a phenomenally valuable inshore fishery um, in the southwest that uh, collapsed um, 70s, 80s. Um, mainly from a transition of using uh, pots and traps to much more unselective trammel nets and tangle nets um, uh, to such an extent and also through collection by divers as well there was some contribution for, for people picking by hand um, such that in the uh, early 2000s um, all the fisheries were considered to be in unfavorable condition in the southwest 
and as a consequence it's become a protected species and uh, named features in some MPAs that have objectives to recover. Uh, despite the value of it and despite the historic issues with the fishery there aren't any kind of formal scientific stock assessments that are carried out for this particular species which is quite different to things like lobster and crab which have regular annual surveys. Uh, so what that means is that the the status of, of the stocks of crawfish are really really quite uncertain. Um, been quite exciting in the last few years, um, last five years or so, six years, there's been quite a few, well, lots of anecdotal reports of um, the instances of, of crawfish becoming much more common. Um, Keith Hiscock wrote a, a nice article in British Wildlife um, a year and a half ago or so, um, kind of tracking some of the history and, and cataloguing some of this uh, recovery. So that really is starting to suggest that the, the population is, is re-establishing um, down in the southwest. But without any kind of formal surveys, how 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 certain can we be that that's true? Where is the recovery happening, and and to what extent is it is it just one or two here and there, or is it um, every everywhere we look? And so the work I've been doing over the last year or so is to try and establish whether data from sea search um, can provide robust evidence about these sorts of recoveries, these sorts of population trends, uh, and trying to not just consider. Um, England as a whole, uh, but to um, but to try and divide it up into separate regions. And crawfish are the, not the only large crustacean for which there are fisheries, um, so I'm, I'm making some comparisons as well between similar sized uh, animals that live in, in similar sorts of habitats like brown crab and, and lobster. Um, and I'm hoping uh, to be able to see whether some of these patterns in uh, reoccurrence, uh, whether those are mirrored in, in the fisheries in terms of landings or not. So let's think about um, what can be done with records collected by sea search divers. And what we can see on the, on the screen here is the kind of traditional way of um, plotting positions and seeing where in, in two-dimensional space uh, records are actually found. So we can uh, amalgamate these through different years. Um, you can see where points are occurring from, from different blocks of time. And that's certainly a valuable and historically uh, frequently used approach. Um, but there are limitations with that. A slightly nicer way is to use something called kernel density estimates in, in uh, um, GIS software that can provide nice animated heat maps um, of where those positions occur. So we're adding an extra dimension of changing time uh, here. Um, so let's just run this through. We can see how um, we can see where the distributions of uh, the animals being found are occur. So the, the uh, red marks showing whether a greater intensities or greater frequencies of um, animals being found. So ticking through the early teens and starting to see a few more, 2015 to lots more around uh, Devon coastline, 17 big Cornwall and Devon ending uh, the series there in 2018 where we can see they're pushing right through uh, Lime Bay out towards Portland. There's just the, 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 the first indications that uh, individuals are making it right the way through to Hampshire. So there's a much more visual impression of how records for the, a particular species uh, change through time. But there's a, a big generic issue with these sorts of detection surveys, and that's caused by non-detection being uh, an ambiguous thing. If you don't record a particular species, that might be because it really is not present in that site, or it might also be because um, that site is occupied, you just didn't see it for some reason when you when you visited. And so there's a, a separation here between needing to understand the, the probabilities of occupancy um, by understanding the probability of detection um, separately from the, the, the rate of occupancy. 
Um, and if we're just plotting points on a, on a flat map, like we've just seen in the previous couple of slides, they, they can't do that. That's looking only at occupancy and not giving any, um, uh, any emphasis to the, the probability of detection. There are other problems in that um, surveys uh, like those done by C-Search are, are biased. Um, and that's not uh, intentional bias, people collecting things on, on purpose or for any untoward reason. It just means that points are um, scattered differently in space. Um, so we can see some areas of the coastline have very few points and some have very many. Uh, there is bias through time. So on the top right here, we can see a plot of the number of records per year since um, the first sea search records um, were, were recorded. A big increase from, from the early 2000s, and it's been fairly steady over the last 10 years or so. But there's clearly, if you're, you're considering over a longer time period, um, there's great variability in the, the, the temporal intensity of, of sampling. You can think of it at smaller scales as well. But what's the effort per visit? If you if you spend uh, an hour underwater, you can probably see and record more species than if you're just there for ten minutes. <clears throat> and of course, on a, on any particular dive, there will be effects of detectability. So if you go diving in the Tamar, you probably won't see very many uh, um, many things at all. But if you go off to some lovely clear oceanic water off Hands Deep or the Edston, um, you may well be able to see lots of uh, lots more stuff. So there's various biases that uh, influence the detectability um, and the numbers of uh, records that, that actually get made on a, on a particular survey. So there's some consequences of these biases and that is um, if there are changes in the number of observers or surveys or the length of surveys or differences in observer experience, that influences detectability and variation in detectability um, can uh, mask existing trends or um, create false trends um, that aren't actually real. Uh, and, and these are real long-standing, well understood problems with uh, these sorts of um, ad hoc and unstructured surveys such as uh, those from most of citizen science really. So let's have a quick look at um, the sort of bias we might have in sea search records. Um, we can see here is a, a plot of the number of potential surveyors. So that's the number of people that have been trained through sea search over the last 20 years. So we train more people every year. So there's potentially a bigger pool of, of potential surveyors. Um, so that might potentially drive trends in, uh, in occupancy. Uh, but if we look at the number of surveys per year over the last 10 years, that, that shows a, a decline and then a, a leveling off. So it'd be very difficult to use that decline in the number of surveys to explain an increase in the number of records um, as we might be able to uh, do for, for crawfish. And the number of records per year, as in the number of species recorded by all those surveys, um, again, has been fairly constant over the last 10 years or so. So that's suggesting maybe that uh, the more records being made on each survey, surveyors may be getting better, um, training is improving, the uh, ID guides are getting better and so forth. So all of these are, are biases that exist in C-Search uh, that make it problematic for robust interpretation about trends of populations. Uh, digital cameras also, yes, they've clearly been uh, contributing our, to our ability to record and subsequently identify many more species than, than we could have done 10 or 15 years ago. So what, are there any solutions to this bias? Um, well, there are a bunch of uh, statistical tools um, and the ones I'm going to talk about this evening fall within a, a tool called Sparta. And this has been developed over about the last seven or eight years by um, uh, academics at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And they uh, develop these tools um, in the R software environment. It's all freely available. You can access it from, from GitHub if, uh, if you want to have a, have a go with it. But they have a, a set of four 
tools that um, are uh, applied to these sorts of data in order to try and minimize the problems caused by spatial and temporal bias. The first off is the, the, the simplest, that's aggregation. Um, there's also data selection approaches for correcting for sample effort. And then there's these um, kind of more complex statistical models um, that uh, the data can be applied to. So aggregation first off, that's the kind of like the traditional atlases, the bird atlas of Britain type approach where all the records for a, let's say a decade are, are plotted together and you can see course changes from one decade to another. And those are really easy to generate through the, the data portals such as uh, um, National Biodiversity Network and things like that with uh, large amounts of freely available data over quite long time periods. The data selection methods, well, those are um, intending to eliminate the bias by focusing on only the, the best sets of records, the most sampled places. So you can filter according to some particular threshold um, and, and discard the places that have few records or, or only visited very seldom. Uh, this has a consequence of, of loss of power. You're not able to detect trends that are there um, because uh, you're using, um, using fewer records, smaller amount of data. Uh, a third approach is to um, look at kind of indices for that compare the area uh, occupied between one time period and another. Uh, and those are quite good at um, evening out the bias that happens from kind of spatial variability in, in sampling effort. And the, the fourth one um, are often kind of called occupancy models. And these use repeated visits to a particular site to build up a detection history. Um, so is the species vis uh, seen or not on a sequence of visits to the same place? And this approach, these occupancy models, uh, are used extensively in the state of nature report that uh, you, you may well have heard of. Um, there's a large number of uh, kind of conservation environmental organizations that put together this report every three years and they plot population trends now for over 8,000 different species uh, using these occupancy models and they cover all sorts. It's all the birds and all the bugs and the bees and the plants and the, the liverworts and the ferns and the mosses and the freshwater fish and the dragonflies and you name it. Um, but there's not much in the marine world there. There's a few plankton, um, fish of economic value, uh, dolphins and whales and things that people are like us are perhaps less concerned about. Um, there's no benthic species. I don't think there's one benthic species listed in those uh, 8,000 um, in, in the State of Nature report. And I think that's a, a, a bit of a travesty and uh, I kind of have high hopes of being able to use the C-Search data to try and rem remedy that, uh, that massive gap. Um, So these occupancy models provide the ability statistically to estimate those two different components, the occupancy, whether something is actually found or not, and the probability of whether it's seen or not, if it's there. And this approach really um, is very powerful at minimizing the effects of bias caused by variation in effort through space or time. And it does that by looking at all the records, not just the crawfish, all the other records that made for every other taxon on every survey. So recording from one taxon tells you something about a taxon that's not there. So looking at change in your target species relative to change in all the species recorded. And this is where C-Search is so good because we record everything that's, that's that we see and, and can identify. And so it gives us tremendous power to look at the detectability of our target species. And uh, it's nice and easy to break down by, by regions, which is convenient as well. So which of those four methods are, are best? The, well, CEH have done some really extensive simulations um, and they show that the kind of the aggregation methods 
well, they're, they're still static. The, the correction methods often fail. Um, the, the methods where you select your best data are robust, but they, they sacrifice power. So they're only able to detect more coarse large scale changes. And by, by a long shot, the occupancy modeling is, is the best approach to, to minimize the effects of that, uh, that bias develop population trends that are kind of robust and believable. So I set out to use this software to build occupancy models for, for sea search data, um, build a detection history of whether or not a species was found in a series of, of, uh, of surveys. Um, you plot that against a, a, a grid of your site. So uh, in this case, I used one by one kilometer grid cells, each provided with a, a unique site. Um, looking at data over 20 years um, and in a model that uh, crazy computer power now can, can deal with these sorts of iterations, but with 100,000 iterations um, and considering only records where there'd been at least uh, visits over two years to any particular site. And uh, um, looked at the population trends provided by those for, for crawfish, brown crab, and, and lobster. So here we are. Here's the exciting stuff. This is a hot out of the, the computer um, pretty much yesterday afternoon, actually. Um, so this is the, the best quality population trajectory for crawfish in Cornwall that I think uh, that exists. Um, and we can see really very clearly what we all kind of thought had happened, but here it is kind of with hard evidence on, on, on the screen. Virtually zero sites um, surveyed by, uh, by Sea Search um, had crawfish over from the early 2000s right the way up to 2013. And then from kind of 14, 15 onwards, um, massive increase such that in the last few years, virtually every square kilometer which Sue Search has visited has um, been occupied, by, occupied somewhere by, by crawfish. And that's very encouraging. It's really quite a remarkable change in, in population over quite a short period of time. Um, and there's various kind of metrics that you can calculate to kind of represent that. Um, so I was delighted when this came out. It's kind of really good um, indication of what we thought was happening. There's kind of backup for those anecdotal stories of, of recovery. Um, the gray bars, the, the kind of the ribbon round about the main line is giving us some indication of the variability that the model, so that, that model running 100,000 times, how much variability to get in the answers for each year um, from, from run to run. The wider the gray, the more variable the model prediction for that particular year um, and the narrower the, the ribbon, the, the, the tighter the, the fit of the model, the more we believe it. So if we look uh, a little bit along the, the coast a little bit, heading, heading east, um, South Devon, we see a, a very similar pattern, pretty close to zero um, right the way through up until 2015 and then a a similar pattern to Cornwall where it takes off from 2015 onwards. Not quite to the same extent, so um, of the one kilometer grid cells surveyed in, in South Devon, more than 50% of them now contain, uh, contain crawfish. Um, and that may be a reflection of differences in habitat or all sorts of other reasons, but um, the, the pattern there is, is consist consistent and similar. If we look on North Devon, where there's far less uh, sampling by sea search and um, perhaps less suitable habitat for, for crawfish, we see a very different pattern. We have a line just going exactly horizontally across with massive credible intervals, confidence intervals. Um, and that's as a clear message from the, 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 the model saying that um, uh, I've got no ability to detect any pattern or change here at all. It's saying there's no pattern. Um, I can't. I can't find anything in the data. There's not enough information in the data. There's not enough records and points for me to develop any um, population trend for. So 
we can't really say very much about coral fish in North Devon other than we haven't got enough data to, to make anything sensible of it. If we move a little bit further east into Dorset now, um, we have another similar situation, apart from one very small point here at the uh, the end. It's, it's not saying that um, uh, every grid cell in Dorset has crawfish, but we have one point there that's starting to be a little bit more, more believable. Um, and that's a reflection of there being more records um, in Dorset in, in the last couple of years. So there's lots more work to be done. There's, there's not a population trend that I can produce for Dorset yet, but it's getting to the point now where we're starting to have enough records in the last couple of years where the, the model can actually deal with it and produce something potentially useful. So two or three years down the line, if we still see the sorts of uh, numbers that we are seeing at the moment, then I'd anticipate being able to produce something a little bit more um, useful for, for, for Dorset. So we can see spatial variability in the outputs of the models, partly as a reflection of what's going on on the seabed in reality with the crawfish and partly through um, differences in the amount and availability of data for the model to work with. If we look at a different species, so let's have a look at uh, brown crab. Um, we're probably not very surprised to see that it, it occurs everywhere. It's seen on most dives. Um, and uh, these are very narrow confidence bands and we can see, yeah, pretty much everywhere we go, um, every kilometer grid square um, in those three counties, we would uh, um, be quite happy to believe that there's, there's crab living there. Um, interesting in Dorset, I haven't looked into this very much, it'd be worth uh, a bit of time and effort following up some indication of a decline in the occupancy for brown crab in Dorset. And I know nothing about the, the fishery there or its management or what's happening with landings, but that would all be really quite interesting and fruitful things to, to explore. Um, if this really is a true trend of a kind of a, a drop off, a decrease from 95% kind of occupancy down towards about 80%. Um, but yeah, more work for the future, I think. And we can do the same for looking at lobster. Um, not quite as uh, regularly found in Cornwall as, as brown crab. Um, looks like a, a slight increasing trend in population there. Um, and so again, very different patterns to the crawfish is the, 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 the main point that I was wanting to make. Um, it's not just changes in what people are doing influencing patterns of uh, occurrence. It's these are believably and almost uncontrovertibly things that are actually happening in the populations and not a reflection of, of what people are doing. So what uh, what are we going to move on to the f in the future? Um, if we've got a, a re-established population, managing the crawfish is likely to be challenging because they're tasty, they attract a really big price and there's a big demand from them from France and Spain particularly. Um, these models are really showing that uh, in inshore waters at least there's been um, a very distinct recovery in the population, a real expansion of the occupancy in Cornwall and South Devon since 2015. More recently there's hints that those populations are really expanding through to Dorset and maybe even Hampshire too. Uh, that begs the question, is this just a boom and bust thing? Are they going to go away again or are we going to develop a stable population that could potentially support a sustainable fishery? Um, I've heard some rumours that the number of records in 2020 are, are dipping down from previous years, but I haven't, I haven't got any evidence for that yet. Um, and we'll wait for the, the sea search records from 2020 to, to, to see if there's any kind of firm evidence for that. Um, the delights with these sorts of approaches is that you can just add the next year of records on um, and rerun the model again and you get another dot on the end of your population trend uh, and you can see what happens in, in any year relative to the previous years. And I'm quite interested in following up with uh, 
uh, data from the MMO about landings and uh, from the IFCAs about landings per unit effort and see whether there's um, uh, concurrent patterns in those that are reflecting the change in the population of, of the crawfish. Uh, I might just skip over the next two slides, I won't talk about those too much. Um, So these occupancy models, um, they're quite new. They're used broadly in the terrestrial world, but I say not yet in the um, in the benthic world. Um, but I think that next to kind of large scale proper stock assessments, they probably provide the, the best evidence that uh, can go to, to help support management of, of stocks. And so hopefully there'll be the interest in these sorts of outputs um, in, in the future. They can also be used to encourage uh, these sorts of species to be included as named features in, in designated areas. If they are reappearing in further east than we've, we've ever remembered them occurring, then perhaps we should be trying to protect them and en encouraging them to be named features to set closed areas and apply other, other management tools. So finish up now, um, CSAT's data can clearly is enough and of good quality to be able to develop um, good robust population trends for benthic species. Um, crawfish are recovering in the southwest but it varies a bit from place to place. Um, the trends for crawfish differ to the trends seen for other species and that gives us kind of belief in that these are actually things happening with um, the species and not just a function of um, the changes in, in diver effort and diver distribution. It's really important to remember these are patterns only for places that people go diving at diveable depths and the places that people want to go. We have no information about other areas or, or, or deeper waters. Um, but I really believe that uh, occupancy models should be used much more uh, in the future to help support future management. Um, so we've been funded by various organisations to, to do this work. Um, the biggest thanks, of course, have to go to all of you guys that uh, collect those data to, to give up your time to go and uh, make these records um, uh, on an entirely voluntary basis and for the people that help coordinate you to do that. So without you guys, there, there wouldn't be any of this, um, these, these cool tools and these, these interesting uh, population predictions. Um, so yeah, big thanks to you guys. Keep it up. Right, so that's that's me all done. Um, yeah, delighted to answer any questions either now or or on email or at, at some other time. So yeah, over to you, Lynn. I'll uh, I'll uh, pipe down now. Right, thank you very much, Angus.